Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Alberta and Quebec loosen COVID restrictions and Ontario prepares to. I don't think many of us can survive much longer. With cases down, but the variants circulating, is the timing right? I think it is a critical tool that enables the reopening of the economy. The push to find a rapid test protocol for workplaces. Oh, give it. Across the prairies, a polar vortex that's broken records and closed schools. And on the eve of impeachment, round two. It'll come down to what did he believe was true. What's at stake for Donald Trump and for the Republican Party? This is The National. Three provinces are ready to take a calculated risk. They're loosening some lockdown restrictions to take pressure off people and businesses. And here's why. The stricter measures they imposed over the holidays have, weeks later, yielded some dramatic results. In the first week of January, Ontario reported more than 22,000 new cases. Last week, that dropped to fewer than 10,000. Quebec went from nearly 18,000 to under 8,000. And in Alberta, the steepest decline of all, from about 6,800 to 2,500. So now they're reaching for the right mix of freer movement and caution. Magda Gabrasalase shows us what that will look like. Working alone in her store in northern Ontario, Gabriel Roy is excited to know customers may soon be allowed back in. I don't think many of us can survive much longer if this continues. But now a reason for hope. We're seeing some sunlight break through the clouds. Today, Ontario's premier announced the province is easing restrictions. The stay-at-home order being lifted in stages. Three regions will drop it this week. Most of the province, possibly next week and the color-coded system for varying degrees of restrictions is back with changes. We'll be allowing non-essential retail businesses to reopen with stronger restrictions, including capacity limits, even in the gray lockdown zones. The reason, declining COVID case numbers and hospitalizations. That's true for Alberta too, where indoor dining was allowed today for the first time since late last year. It's stressful, actually being inside all the time and not going out. And now that everything seems to be opening up, well, we, we kind of enjoy that. Closed since Christmas in Quebec, shopping malls and salons are open for business now. But this expert worries that consequences could follow. Anytime you talk about loosening or easing or, or lifting the restrictions, there is a danger that the numbers could go back up again and we might end up undoing all the good work that we've done over the past few weeks fueling even more concern, variants of the virus. Ontario now has all three of the more contagious forms. When it comes to the variant first found in the UK, this academic warns. You know, probably in four to six weeks, we can expect uh, about 50% of the cases to be the variant of concern, and at that point it's going to take over. Which could mean stricter measures make a comeback if cases climb. Okay, so Magda, Ontario's stay-at-home order is still in effect for the harder-hit Toronto, Peel and York regions. Remind us of the plan there. Well, that order won't be lifted for at least two weeks, so that's February 22nd at the earliest. And it's important to note that here in Toronto, all three variants have been found, including the country's only case of the variant first reported in Brazil. So if there are more cases that, that show up, if cases climb in general, it is very possible that that's going to impact restrictions and whether or not they are eased anytime soon, Andrew. Of course. Okay. Thank you very much, Magda. You're welcome. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador went in the other direction today. All group activities for recreation and the arts have been suspended in the St. John's area, and there are new restrictions on visitors to long-term care homes. This is because of 11 new cases reported today. That's a big spike there. And hundreds more people are in isolation after an outbreak at a high school where two students tested positive. The province had been relatively untouched for months. By contrast, another Atlantic province just looks a lot like Canada's promised land. Nova Scotia has reached a place where we'd all like to be. Only eight active cases and now the return of some freedoms all Canadians once took for granted. Kayla Hounsell shows us what good news looks like. Here we go, boys, let's go! 
These kids have been back playing hockey for weeks now, but today, for the first time in more than two months, their parents are here too. We're safe. It's awesome. We've been waiting for so long, and it's big build up all day to get here. Up to 100 fans are now allowed in the stands. Theaters too can once again have audiences. Your commitment to following the protocols reassures us that by opening up a little more, we should be okay. Are you full or can I come in? Absolutely. <laughs> Staff at this outdoor gear store have been counting the number of people entering to stay within 50% capacity. As of today, the limit increases to 75%. Anything that's loosening up restrictions and is going to bring in people to purchase is awesome for us. Businesses can also now host events with up to 100 people inside and 150 people outside. That includes festivals, wedding receptions and funerals with visitation. What is not changing is the restriction on bars and restaurants to stop serving by 10 and close by 11. There certainly could be outbreaks. Still, this infectious disease specialist who advises the Ontario government on its reopening supports Nova Scotia's plan. There certainly is the capacity to rapidly identify cases and respond to cases very, very quickly. And because of that capacity and because of the low rates of infection in the community to begin with, I think it's totally fair to start thinking about reopening. The province is warning Nova Scotians not to abuse their newfound freedom. If our epidemiology starts to um, look not so good, we will uh, rapidly uh, make the changes that are necessary. These parents find it hard to look away. <laughs> We've taken a lot of steps to get here, and I'm hoping that all the other provinces in Canada can get to the same place as us. Then more people will have reason to cheer. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Dartmouth. Now, as you heard Mukta mention earlier, when it comes to reopening plans, coronavirus variants are a wild card. And for now, there are three main ones thought to have originated in the UK, South Africa, and Brazil. Now, all three have mutations of the spike protein used to infect human cells. And as we heard, have all been found to be more contagious, potentially increasing cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Now, the variant first detected in the UK has been found in seven provinces. The one first reported in South Africa has been found in four. And so far, as you heard, Ontario is the only province to see a case of the one originating in Brazil. But this picture isn't complete because testing for variants isn't uniform across Canada. Ontario is the only province pledging to test every positive COVID result for mutations. So top of mind for everyone is the question of how well the vaccines will work against these new variants. So here's Vicodopia now with findings out of South Africa that have experts concerned and also what it means for this country. The variant first identified in South Africa pushed the country's hospitals close to the brink last month. Now the desperately needed rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine is on hold. After early signs, it failed to prevent most mild or moderate cases, raising questions about how effective it is against severe cases. We don't want to end up with a situation where we vaccinated a million people or two million people with a vaccine that may not be effective in preventing hospitalization and severe disease. AstraZeneca was considered the best hope against the coronavirus. It's much cheaper than other vaccines and considered 100% effective against severe infection. Canada pre-ordered 20 million doses. That was before the emergence of more contagious variants. This is clearly concerning news. However, there are some important caveats. While the WHO is worried, it points out the new data from South Africa is incomplete. It was based on a small group of young, low-risk patients, so more study is needed. But Europe isn't waiting. Several countries are racing to stay ahead of new variants as millions of vials of the newly approved vaccine arrive. We've seen the first data set you know, from real-life infection from the heat of battle in South Africa saying it's got reduced efficacy against those mild and moderate infections but the jury's still out on what it means for severe or fatal infections. Researchers say reconfiguring vaccines to target new variants is not only possible, it could be done relatively quickly. This is a huge feat when we look at how we were previously making vaccines. So we're almost able to keep up with the virus. If vaccines fail to control the spread of new variants, 
the world could be in for a longer and more costly battle against COVID-19. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Now, along with vaccines, there is another weapon in the fight to lift restrictions and reopen the economy, the rapid screening test. Peter Armstrong shows how the private sector is joining in the public health battle. Even while Canada struggles with the worst economic ruin in generations, there's a spectacular effort rolling out behind the scenes, working on a way to get employees back into these towers safely. We need to figure it out. Ajay Agrawal from the University of Toronto says rapid screening tests are key. So he banded together with some of the biggest companies in Canada, including Air Canada, Suncor, the Bank of Nova Scotia. We were certainly not handed any you know, instruction book. Um, and so we've spent the last uh, three months writing one. You'll get notified um, to check your app. And they came up with a 400-page playbook. And last month, the consortium companies began trying it out. Last week, the aerospace giant behind the Canada arm began testing volunteers. I think it's incredibly important. I think it is um, a critical tool that enables the reopening of the economy. A couple of times a week, Holly Johnson gets screened as she enters her building in Brampton. Within 15 minutes, she gets a text with the results. It is a, a peace of mind that um, as I go on my daily life in as safe as possible manner. The peace of mind is great, but the purpose of the pilot is to find a universal system that works in any size or kind of company, whether they're a small business or an oil giant like Suncor. We need to learn this together. We need to move quickly. And so I think that's what, uh, what CDL and what this consortium is helping to bring to the table. Making it work for everyone also means making it as seamless as possible. The first test took seven minutes to complete. And we got that from seven minutes down to four minutes, from four minutes down to three minutes. And the last count I saw was uh, uh, just over 90 seconds. Now the pilot project is expanding. Over the next weeks and months, that instruction manual will go to hundreds more businesses, big and small, in hopes that when and if the virus subsides, the businesses will be ready to fill these halls once again. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. An Alberta pastor has been charged after his church repeatedly flouted pandemic restrictions. RCMP say that yesterday the Grace Life Church was more than double the currently permitted capacity. This follows many other alleged violations of the Public Health Act. In December, for example, Pastor James Coates was issued a $1,200 ticket. He is scheduled to appear in court next month. Well, there's good news from South Asian communities in B.C. tonight. Their transmission rates have dropped dramatically. Anita Bath examines what and who is behind that sharp decline. Then there were some family members that did say, oh, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. Gurvi Dillon says he, like many people in the South Asian community, felt shame when he was diagnosed with COVID-19. You're kind of embarrassed, right? He ended up being hospitalized for 33 days, even put on a ventilator. But by the time he came out, attitudes among South Asians had started to change. I do see a big time improvement from the people saying, the uh, the um, the more educational we get on COVID, the better it is for our community. BC doesn't track race-based COVID data, but the Fraser Health Authority is home to the three municipalities with the highest percentage of South Asians in the province. All have seen significant drops in COVID numbers. Surrey cutting cases by more than half since November. Part of the reason, restrictions put in place by the province. But Fraser Health also credits community organizations. I think there's been a huge amount of commitment from our partners, ranging from Gurdwara schools to, to community agencies to businesses and media outlets to really support and come together. The South Asian COVID Task Force has played a big role, translating public health orders into culturally relevant information. So infomercials, radio, TV, in languages people understand. WhatsApp, Blast Channels, uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. They wanted to help eliminate the unconscious bias they were seeing associated with rising case numbers in Fraser Health as people pointed fingers at the South Asian community. They didn't want the negativity to make the situation worse. The feedback we've gotten is that they see themselves in the infographics. We've done some skits where they see scenarios and they feel like they understand the public health messaging. 
Transmission rates can change at a moment's notice, but for now, the South Asian community sees the downward trend as a victory with the hope of more improvement to come. I need a bath, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, so let's turn to some other news, starting with a deep freeze spreading across the country. A polar vortex is expected to envelop parts of Ontario and Quebec tomorrow. The extreme cold has already made itself felt from Yukon across the prairies to northern Ontario. Cameron McIntosh shows us how people have been dealing with these pretty harsh temperatures. Crystallized fog at sunrise in Edmonton. Oh, Cranky car batteries in Regina. This was never an if. Kind of expected eventually, right? Expect it, maybe dread it, but across the West, got to accept it. A late winter polar vortex abruptly dropping temperatures into the minus 30s, even 40s. In some places, creating wind chills feeling like minus 50. And still not cold enough to keep Hazel Boris and Liv Valmestad away from their community snow maze. It is my only gym, so I come out here almost every day. In the winter of COVID, the urge to find social reprieve still stronger than the cold. Everything is now through Zoom and I teach through Zoom, so it's a, a great break to get out of that uh, seat. This is a skating trail along the Assiniboine River in Winnipeg, where right now the air temperature is minus 27 degrees Celsius, but feels more like minus 43 with the wind chill. Certainly not unheard of temperatures in Winnipeg for February, but after an abnormally warm November, December and January, the first real onset of a winter cold snap feels like a bit of a shock. The fact that we've escaped it uh, up to beyond the halfway point of winter has really been the story. Late, but cold enough to shut schools and prompt safety warnings. Shelters are making room. Marguerite Kekagamic has been sleeping outside. It was, was nothing more than we can handle. Because uh, if it gets too cold, then we, well, we know what to do. Eh? We, we can go inside the shelter. It's not expected to warm up for at least another 10 days. Still, this far into winter, there's a feeling this may be a little more tolerable, especially when there's not much to do but get outside. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, nasty winter weather has also shut down big swaths of Atlantic Canada. Much of Newfoundland and Labrador remains under weather warnings tonight as heavy snow and intense winds combine for blizzard-like conditions. The Maritimes, meanwhile, is cleaning up after that same system brought harsh conditions last night and into this morning, leading to a wave of school and business closures. Rescue efforts continue tonight in northern India, a day after deadly flooding killed at least two dozen people. Nearly 200 are believed to still be missing after part of a remote Himalayan glacier broke away, triggering a huge flood that burst open a nearby dam. Most of the missing are believed to be workers from two hydropower plants. In Myanmar, pro-democracy demonstrators kept up the pressure on the military today, protesting the coup in the streets and with a nationwide strike. But as Rene Filipponi tells us, the generals who overthrew the government are cracking down. The water cannons fired on a crowd of thousands, an attempt to drown out the voices of dissent in Myanmar's capital. For days now, protests against the military coup have grown to include civil disobedience and strikes. We're not going to allow this military dictatorship to pass on to our next generation, says this man. We will continue to protest till it fails. It's been a week since many politicians and activists were rounded up by the military, including Mia A, seen in this security video. His family hasn't heard from him since. There are a lot of, you know, uh, baseless uh, rumours going around as well, so we are uh, quite worried about him. Daughter Wei Hin not only worries about those in custody, but everyone on the streets. The military has been challenged by civilian uprisings twice before. In 1988 and 2007, both times there was bloodshed. People on the ground are risking their lives for human rights and democracy, but uh, they need support and help from the international community. A statement posted by the Embassy of Canada calls on the military to refrain from all forms of violence against peaceful protesters and to release those detained. 
We reached the ambassador in Yangon today. But at this point, we are still working on diplomacy, but other options are being explored. Of course, we're not the only country looking at that. Uh, we're trying to do the best we can to move the, 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 the situation in a positive direction. The military has justified its show of force with claims of widespread election fraud following the landslide victory of Aung San Suu Kyi. In his first address since the coup, General Min Aung Lang promised a new election under a reformed election commission. Tonight, his message was met by the sound of defiance. People on their balconies once again banging pots and pans as new curfews and rules on social gatherings are imposed. Rene Filipponi, CBC News, London. Okay, well, Canadian black-owned businesses are finding new ways to realize a common goal. If there's going to be any progress for especially black community, we have to do that together. Up next, how the Buy Black movement is going national. Plus, on the eve of Donald Trump's second impeachment trial... Walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol. What you need to know about the case against the former president. And later, a different kind of Super Bowl MVP. It is they who every day honor us. Amanda Gorman's old teacher reflects on that moment and what's next. We're back in two. Electric car company Tesla has turbocharged Bitcoin with a 1.5 billion U.S. dollar investment, and it says it even plans to start accepting it as payment. But if Tesla's going to price cars and say this car costs a Bitcoin or two Bitcoins or two and a half or whatever, uh, there's a certain currency normalization that could happen. The value of one Bitcoin jumped as much as 20 percent over the past 24 hours, hitting 60,000 Canadian dollars at one point. Analysts still consider it volatile. OK, across Canada, there is increased interest in supporting black owned businesses. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, the buy black movement has a long history, but also a present day challenge, making it sustainable. Tucked away in a Toronto strip mall, a recent business school grad's first venture, Royalty Coffee. I'm ethnically from Africa, um, sourcing a product close to Somalia. It, it kind of feels like home. To help spread the word about her new company beyond her own community, Adil Hassan Mohammed contacted Black Owned Toronto, an Instagram account and website that puts a spotlight on black owned businesses in the city. Days later, the account's founder shared the story of Royalty Coffee to her tens of thousands of followers. Mohammed says she got many followers as a result and more sales. I've gotten a lot of people to make purchases and that was my overall goal. Now the local initiative is going national. Businesses from across the country can sign up to be part of Black Owned Canada, a new searchable directory and expanded online store. Wherever you are in Canada, you'll be able to go on the website and find what's around you that's Black Owned. Global searches for Black Owned spiked in May and June of last year as the Black Lives Matter movement took off. But the idea of buying Black goes back decades and so do Black Owned directories. This is actually bringing back something that seemed to just like fizzle out in the 2000s. Other online directories have launched since then, like Afrobiz and Buy Blacks. But this professor says the challenge historically had been getting people to know they exist. A black directory still leaves it on the individual to have the desire to go and find those things. Still, she says there's even more power to be found in businesses banding together. We have to realize in the 21st century, if there's going to be any progress for especially black community, we have to do that together. We have to be a collective. For Mohammed, black owned Canada is part of that. Joining forces and working together, it helps. So she can focus on the daily grind and keep new customers coming back. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, setting the stage for a historic impeachment trial. How the Democrats will make their case and what this means for the future of the Republican Party. And later, a housing strategy bringing much more than a home to those in need. Welcome back. Well, this is the eve of the second impeachment trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump, this time for inciting an insurrection. And today, 
Democrats called it the most grievous constitutional crime ever committed. So tonight, two stories size up the stakes. In a few minutes, Katie Simpson on what all of this is doing to the Republican Party. But first, let's look at the events and the words that together are evidence for impeachment. Paul Hunter takes us to Capitol Hill where it will unfold and where it all started. The sounds and images stunned America. Not since the War of 1812 had anyone stormed the U.S. Capitol building. Surely there would be a price to pay for whoever caused the rioters to do this. Say Democrats, the culprit is clear. The rioters were incited by Donald Trump, who egged them on. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. In that speech, at that rally, in his waning days as president. What followed soon after, the world well knows. The resolution is adopted. Without Within days, Trump was impeached in the House of Representatives for inciting an insurrection. Donald Trump is a clear and present danger to our country. It is now up to the U.S. Senate to convict him and perhaps disqualify Donald Trump from ever again running for office. At issue in his trial, a handful of key questions, all leading to the big one. What caused the rioters to riot? Did Trump intend for his speech to be taken as a call for violence? And is it reasonable to believe that his words would have that effect? Democrats underline, before you get to the rioting, it's important to understand that when Trump talks, Trump voters listen hard. And so context matters. When Trump falsely claimed the election was stolen, that message resonated with Trump voters. And Trump said it again and again. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. They're trying to rig an election, and we can't let that happen. His lawyers argued the same thing in court after court. But even though in every meaningful case they lost, Trump kept at it for all who would listen. Emotions ran high. This rally was two days before the riot. And then I take it this White House, we're going to fight like hell, I'll tell you right now. Then, on January 6th, outside the White House, that final rally. On stage, Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani. Let's have trial by combat. And into that atmosphere, Trump himself. The crowd was supercharged. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. He spoke of being peaceful, but, say Democrats, the key words were these. We're going to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol. And then these. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. It was soon after that that Trump supporters marched on the Capitol with their MAGA hats and their Trump flags, as if to signal this was for him. Oh, there we go. We want Trump! We want Trump! We want Trump! I own this goddamn house. It's in my house. All of which brings us back to the matter of incitement. Is Trump accountable for what happened. Lawyers and lawmakers will now gather in that building to weigh Trump's words and the law. He said, go to the Capitol. Go to the Capitol and show them what you're angry about, essentially. Michigan law professor and free speech expert Nancy Costello underlines U.S. law dictates much must be proven. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen. By the right to speak freely in America is protected by the U.S. Constitution, but there are limits. Among them, you cannot incite a crowd 
to riot. But to be convicted, you must prove intent. What did Trump mean when he said, fight like hell? And that's exactly what his attorneys are um, arguing. Um, Costello predicts his lawyers that. will parse those words carefully. They're saying that what he meant by that is that you have to keep pursuing if you want to make sure that you have a legitimate election now and in the future. That he was not saying, hey, go down to the Capitol, break down the doors, that he didn't say any of that. And so therefore, is it incitement speech? The honesty of our elections and the integrity of our glorious republic. Indeed, Trump's defense is that in that speech January 6th, he was simply defending election integrity. And of course, it'll come down to what did he believe was true, which is what. But are. as well, says he, free he speech expert Gene Polisinski, Democrats will argue that as president, Trump should have known some in that crowd came prepared. That there was already this warning from apparently the FBI. So you can say he could not have conceived it. That's an argument. Uh, but on the other hand, what was his responsibility as president of the United States to know the potential for that? Uh, on that day. Certainly in our country, we knew how passionate this argument uh, was around the country. All of that and more now goes to the test. Including, by the way, whether as an ex-president, it's now too late to try Trump anyway. Still, for so many, it all boils down to the words he used in that speech on that day. Did he incite insurrection? Should he pay a price for what happened? Or will Donald Trump walk away again? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Well, whatever happens in the Senate this week, one thing is very clear. Donald Trump still has a strong hold on the Republican Party. Katie Simpson looks at how this trial is playing out within the GOP. A cold reality awaits Congresswoman Liz Cheney back home in Wyoming. Much like the state's rugged landscape, she's now entered the political wilderness. At this time, when the soul of the party is being torn by two different points of view, At a meeting of state Republicans this past weekend, her once energetic supporters condemned her vote to impeach former President Donald Trump. And I'm going to give you a word picture. She basically middle-fingered the majority of the people of this state. Cheney did not go to the meeting, and as expected, Republicans voted for censure, demanding she resign and that she pay back the money raised for her campaign. Please stand if you are in favor of the resolution. There's no better example of the divide now consuming the Republican Party. Even though Trump is no longer president, loyalty to the leader remains strong. From the MAGA merchandise to all the maskless faces, Trump is the one these people listen to. <laughs> Here in Wyoming, I don't think Liz Cheney could get elected dog catcher after her actions. Even if it puts her political career in jeopardy, Cheney is not backing down. We should not be embracing the former president. My vote to impeach our sitting president is not It's a similar situation for Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler. After her impeachment vote, organizers in Washington state were inundated with complaints. Yeah, it's, it's been massive. It's been intense. Uh, uh, she's in trouble. And Republican Congressman Anthony Gonzalez's impeachment vote is seen as short-sighted by his supporters in Ohio. You know, we have uh, uh, very much been bolstered by the Trump effect. The last thing we need to do is alienate those people who are just recently finding their way into the party and finding a home for themselves here. As the final preparations are put in place for Trump's trial, Fear of upsetting the former president's millions of voters and donors will weigh on the minds of Republican senators who will act as jurors. But what it comes down to is, are they afraid? And what I've seen lately, and it's sort of sad, is most politicians right now in America react on fear, not on courage. This former Republican congressman predicts Trump will be acquitted, but that will not solve his party's problems. He says there needs to be a purging of Trump-style politics, no more conspiracy theories or disinformation, even if it motivates the Republican base. I think long term for the country, it's going to be a horrific thing. And that's why I think Republicans are going to have to be willing to lose on principle before the party can be turned around uh, where ideas and policy trump conspiracy theories and ridiculousness. 
Trump is hunkering down at his Florida estate, mostly hidden from the cameras, save for a round of golf here and there. Whatever the Senate decides, it's clear he still has a firm grip on the grassroots of his party. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, up next, success in tackling homelessness in a very straightforward way. As long as they are homeless and in need of supports, we put that in place first, and then you can work on everything else after. How it's become a pandemic lifeline in just a moment. People who are homeless are particularly vulnerable right now. Not only has the pandemic added another layer of hardship, but these days it's also freezing cold. So enter Housing First, a program that's taken root across the country. Bonnie Allen shows us how it's making a difference in Saskatchewan now more than ever. With temperatures dropping into the minus 30s in Saskatchewan, people who are homeless must desperately search for a spot to warm up. For some, the search is over. Every day, this housing support team makes its rounds, checking in on people who now have homes but are still getting used to it. Stephen Ledoux lived on the streets for years. He broke his neck in a construction accident and began drinking heavily. Hello! How's your morning? Pretty good so far. Ledoux says he used to spend his days digging in dumpsters and drinking with friends, often getting arrested. Drunk in public, drunk in disorderly, uh, just staggering around the city. That all changed when he got accepted into the Housing First program three years ago. He says you can see the difference. Right here, a house. They have, they found me a house as soon as I got it. Uh, got into the program. And then how has that changed your life? I have been in trouble with the law and I'm staying some pretty, pretty good sober now. Over the past decade, Housing First programs have become common in Canadian cities, touted for their simple premise. So it doesn't matter if people are sober, it doesn't matter if they have bad records of tenancy, nothing matters. As long as they are homeless and in need of supports, we put that in place first and then you can work on everything else after. Kendra Giles with Phoenix Residential Society runs the federally funded program in Regina. It has 30 clients. She says Housing First makes even more sense in a pandemic. You couldn't get a more perfect setup given that everyone has their own safe place to call home. People can actually be in a safe place to isolate and then we can bring the supports to them. Her teams make more frequent visits now, delivering groceries, medication, and even alcohol. Uh, depends what they like, uh, beer, vodka, whiskey, or wine. All safer than drinking mouthwash or hand sanitizer. Phoenix received more money from Ottawa this past year to expand its managed alcohol program. Uh, we got your beers here. Thank there you. you. Go. You're welcome. Thank you. Three deliveries a day stops people from going to the bar or liquor store. Okay, have a great day, Wilfred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. 57-year-old Army veteran Rudy McQuig waits for the Phoenix team to arrive. They come and check my house, make sure I'm okay, so they're very protective. Rudy, hello. How was your night? What did you get up to? Just got your medication here. Caseworkers helped him collect social assistance to pay rent and buy groceries. Okay, you have a good day, okay? A couple clients have contracted the virus and they get support to self-isolate. Overall, there have been fewer visits to the hospital emergency room, detox center, jail, and shelters, which can't meet demand. COVID-19 outbreaks have temporarily shut some down and physical distancing rules have cut capacity. Jason Mercury's organization serves vulnerable people, but due to the pandemic, has to frequently turn them away. Pretty much every day where the temperature drops below minus 15, we have people begging us to let them in the building. It's not just us, it's every organization in the city that really is struggling to allow people in and maintain COVID protocols. And we've had people crying, we've had people quite upset. But for Stephen Ledoux, his biggest challenge now is boredom. The more you sit around, the more you want to drink. A Housing First social worker helped Ledoux get a cat who he named COVID to keep him company. So I just mainly stay home. And for that, Ledoux is proud of himself. 
When public health officials urge people to stay home, it's something he can finally do. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. After the break, her words captured the world's attention not once, but twice. It was impressive. It was inspiring. But I'll tell you a little secret. It wasn't surprising. It was just... We check in magic. with Amanda Gorman's former teacher about that voice and why this is just the beginning for the Youth Poet Laureate. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, Trump impeachment trial take two and the Republican politics that will likely lead to an acquittal. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Let us walk with these warriors, charge on with these champions and carry forth the call of our captains. We celebrate them by acting with courage and compassion. The extremely talented Amanda Gorman performing the poem presented last night at the Super Bowl. She paid tribute to frontline heroes of the pandemic while showing once again why so many look up to her. So we reached out to a Toronto man, a retired principal, who got to know Amanda Gorman and her twin sister when he became education director at their school in Santa Monica, California. Amanda made a big impression on Bruce Graham and she continues to. Today, we honor our three captains for their actions and impact in a time of uncertainty and need. They've taken it was the just magical. You know, people keep using the phrase, she nailed it. Well, the answer is she tailored it to exactly the need of the moment. She honored, in the very best sense, the, her audience and the subjects of her poem. It's the gift she has. Amanda and Gabrielle and their mom came in on their visit to New Road School. I like to think that we saw a spark in them and they certainly sparkled. It is they who every day honor us. It was a school I like to characterize as an oasis of learning and I was the education director. That even as we grieve Her words carry such power. Her presentation is pure artistry. She elevates, she illuminates, she liberates. You saw it at the inauguration where of necessity she re-consecrated. For there was always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. It was impressive it was inspiring but i'll tell you a little secret it wasn't surprising amanda was in spanish class with a wonderful teacher by the name of melissa and amanda had said something and melissa said amanda you should be president and amanda said words to the effect of uh someday i will she's remarkable she's the voice of the future in the present and I hope I'm around, I'll be quite elderly, but I hope I'm around uh, to see a presidential run. Maybe. Okay, next on The National, another moment from the Super Bowl that everyone's talking about. Take a look how this moment became an internet sensation. Look guys, I don't even have a stand in. Of course you do. Hold on, is that Drake? That's right. Drake from State Farm. <laughs> yeah, so there was a cameo worth tweeting about. Uh, Drake in a Super Bowl ad for State Farm. And he wasn't even the only Canadian people are talking about today. The weekend's halftime show was uh, full of optical illusions, but there's one moment that maybe felt a little too relatable, and the internet agreed. Tonight, it's our moment. Feeling lost? Well, you aren't alone. The weekend's dance moves and glances to camera in a fun house of mirrors took the internet by storm, and the memes, they just kept on coming. Because whether you're searching for toilet paper during the pandemic, or getting lost in the grocery store, or FaceTiming with your mom, this look is one we've all come to know pretty well.
It's the face you make when you're not able to find the Zoom link, even though it was just emailed to you. So maybe that was his plan all along. Either way, the Scarborough, Ontario native found a way to bring us all together. Thanks to a chaotic sequence, the world and Canadians have been watching on repeat. And I, I will fully admit that, that I am the kind of, I'm not a huge football fan. I am the kind of guy who has to play a bit of catch up the day after the Super Bowl. But that moment, I feel like I've relived a bajillion times. We all have. <laughs> um, I have to say, for me, I this is such an American day, but there was something delightfully subversive about how many Canadians <laughs> were peppered throughout Drake, The Weeknd, Dan Levy of Schitt's yep. Creek. Yep. You good. know, in an M&M commercial, we are everywhere. That is a national for February 8th. Good night. Good night.